Awesome. All right, welcome everybody. Uh, it's uh, my honor to introduce our speakers uh, for our final colloquium uh, of the semester, Andrew Steger and Ellie Evans. And um, I've never actually had uh, either Ellie or Andrew in the class, uh, but I've worked with them on different projects. And uh, I think I speak on behalf of the department when I say that um, they are missed. Um, Andrew graduated last summer from the MA program. And I think as um, you've just heard, he'll be beginning a position um, as a teacher in the Denver School of Science and Technology in the fall. Um, Ellie um, defended a couple of weeks ago and will be graduating next week, actually. Um, and she will be starting a position um, in a couple of weeks, actually, at the city of Boulder in the Department of Transportation. So congratulations to uh, both of you. Um, and uh, I, I, the, another reason I, I think it's important to, to have our students come back as well to present is, is not only to share their knowledge, but I think particularly for uh, Ellie and Andrew, who have been um, exemplary students, I think it's also important uh, for them to come back in this um, situation as role models too. Um, because I think as I look back on the past couple of years uh, working with them, I think they truly embody uh, the breadth and the depth of learning that we that we hope for each and every one of our students uh, in the department. So it's um, truly a privilege, at least for me, to have been a part of their journey uh, in the MA program. Um, but more so, I think today it is our collective privilege to be here to, to learn from both of you, uh, to learn about your knowledge uh, related to uh, qualitative GIS, and to also learn about your perspectives and your experiences. So um, thank you both for taking the time to be here. Uh, and uh, without any further ado, I'll hand it over to Andrew and Nelly. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brian, for that lovely introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Hopefully we can all see that. All right, so thanks again for having us. Um, everyone, it's really an honor um, for both Andrew and I to be here presenting in front of our professors and peers. Obviously, without all of you, we wouldn't be where we are today. We're very grateful. Um, so in this presentation, we're going to talk about qualitative GIS and emotional cartography. Uh, we'll discuss how incorporating qualitative GIS into the GIS decision-making framework can be helpful, why it's important to incorporate qualitative data such as emotion into geography and GIS research, and we'll discuss our own project, which is sort of a culmination of all of these ideas. And um, we'll also talk a little bit about our experience as grad students writing this paper, kind of what the process was like, how we felt about it, and hopefully give some tips and encouragement for other grad students hoping to do um, a similar thing. Um, so first, just a little bit about our background and ourselves. Um, my, my name is Ellie, as you all know. I'm a third year grad student here in the geography department, graduating this semester. Um, I come from a more of a human geography and social science oriented background. And as an undergraduate, um, I became really interested in this idea of qualitative GIS. Um, but when I enrolled at CU, my primary goal was to kind of just gain more concrete, you know, those technical marketable GIS skills in order to get a job and get out of the service industry. Um, thankfully, this department has um, folks with such varied backgrounds and interests and I was able to take courses and meet professors and other people that really renewed my interest in that kind of social human qualitative side of geography and GIS. Um, and again, this project is kind of a culmination of those two um, backgrounds. Such a fun project to work on. Again, a perfect culmination of my two backgrounds, kind of my social science, human geography and my GIS education um, really gave me an opportunity to think critically about the relationship between those fields. Um, and it was just such a joy to work on this with Andrew and Brian. Yeah, and uh, I think that I know most of you, but for those of you who don't, uh, my name is Andrew and I graduated from the GES program last summer uh, with a degree in applied geography. Uh, and I came into the program thinking that I'd be pursuing mostly the physical science side of geography, um, but through a series of events found myself being interested in the social side as well. Uh, so I guess that's one of the exciting things about the program is just kind of the ability to change direction and explore new avenues. Uh, I became interested in this emotional cartography project uh, as an extension of my previously and then newly discovered interest. Uh, for me, it was just a fun way to combine what I knew about GIS uh, with what I was learning about placemaking among youth uh, through a program called Project Voice. 
Uh, but like Ellie, uh, mainly though, is just an excuse to get to spend time with people that I enjoyed working with and that I admired. Um, this picture shows though, that thankfully my non-existent hockey career did not have to suffer for the sake of this project. Uh, and of course, we also can't forget Brian Wee was part of the project. Uh, Ellie and I have actually never taken an official class with him, uh, but he was both of our advisors and more importantly, just a wonderful mentor. Uh, as the catalyst, of the whole operation. Uh, he's kind of the one who brought us together as part of a research assistantship uh, to reimagine his course on children's geographies to include a GIS portion in that. And uh, through several twists and turns, that project is kind of what morphed into this paper. Uh, so yeah, we really can't thank him enough for making all of this possible. Yeah, so let's uh, get into it. Um, so in order to make the case for the need to include emotions and messy human experiences into GIS, uh, we kind of need to start with a common understanding of what GIS actually is and how it's uh, traditionally used. Uh, so for some of this, it's a kind of intro to GIS first week level stuff, but it's important to start on the same page. Uh, yeah, so especially for those of you joining us uh, that are maybe new to the program or uh, don't have this background, Geographic Information Systems uh, is what GIS stands for. And uh, if you've ever taken a Matt Cross course, uh, he gives the definition of a computer-based information system that's designed to work with both spatial and non-spatial data to support a decision-making process. Uh, really importantly though, uh, when you think of the components of a GIS, it's not just the hardware, the software, and the data, uh, but it's also the procedures and the people. So it lets you explore, analyze, and edit uh, both spatial and non-spatial data, as well as let you create these uh, really important outputs. Uh, so not just maps, but also statistical analysis, tables and lists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, then the layers of these data can often then be compared. So traditionally how it's used is that, uh, it's important to know that it just like some pretty wonderful things. Um, within a layer, you can calculate the sizes of features. You can uh, calculate the distances between features, uh, perform summary statistics within the attribute features uh, and so much more. Uh, but yeah, where GIS can really shine is when you take these layers of information and then stack them all together. Uh, so you can stack things like population and income and education level, um, and then locations and information about objects all together. And doing so allows us to do so much more than simply see where something's located. Uh, we can compare these layers when we stack them. Uh, so it can create knowledge uh, that can support our decision making. Um, importantly, it illuminates previously unknown or understudied associations. Uh, it, it can help us summarize spatial data. You know, and if we have different layers from different time periods, we can also see change over time. Uh, so yeah, as an example, um, I like to include this Pope Wu and Boone study. Um, it's one that I use for my spatial statistics class. Um, but yeah, it's this distributive environmental justice study uh, asking if environmental inequities exist uh, regarding exposure to air pollution across different demographics. Uh, so what the authors did is they got all these different layers. Um, they had air, layers for air pollution, which were PM10 and ozone, um, which were created uh, by taking point measurements and interpolating a surface uh, to create a surface of predicted PMN and PM10 and ozone. Uh, and then they compared them to these demographics layers. Uh, so they'd had different layers for race, class, and ethnicity, and age. Uh, and lining up all these layers allowed for a regression to see if there actually was a correlation between different pollutants and demographics. Uh, so this GIS analysis showed us that there's not just like generalized accounts of environmental justice in Phoenix, uh, but also the specifics. Uh, so for instance, there's a strong positive correlation between the proportion of the African-American population with PM10, uh, but a strong negative correlation with ozone. Uh, and in Phoenix, that trend was reser uh, reversed for the proportion of the Native American population. Uh, other times though, no significant relationship was found uh, such as the relationship between medium household income and ozone levels. So importantly, having data such as this uh, can give power to those advocating for social environmental changes. 
Uh, another uh, example that we have uh, is the 2019 status of Denver's children. And uh, this is a document that we'll come back to several times in this presentation, um, but it was created by the Office of Children's Affairs to understand the environmental context that shape uh, how they experience the world. So this resource uh, provides an in-depth information on how Denver's kids and their families are faring using a variety of indicators. Uh, yeah, looking at the actual numbers, as well as the places with the high or low concentration of factors is how they do this. Uh, so yeah, the, the resource is intended to be used to inform programs and services and investment in children as youth uh, as they relate to the city's goals for the children. Uh, so the first map that we can see here, um, it shows uh, free and reduced lunch eligibility. Uh, you know, it's, we can easily see kind of this inverted L pattern that we have within the city. Uh, the darker areas are uh, higher concentrations of where kids need free and reduced lunch. Uh, the second map uh, is one of the other maps that they show, uh, which is the percentage of children to single parent households. Again, it can see kind of the inverted L shape in Denver. Um, yeah, but the third map is really important because it aggregates many of the individual risk factors together. Uh, so it includes things like unemployment and violent crime and absenteeism, kindergarten readiness, teen births, etc. Uh, all into one resource that uh, policymakers can then use to help allocate different resources. Um, so yeah, it's important to know as well that the document that it came in uh, has much more data than just this map. Uh, so it had data on educational attainment, unemployment rate, uninsured children, obesity, uh, after school funding. Uh, basically, if you can think about it, it had it. Um, and you can obviously tell a lot about chi what childhood might look like uh, based on all these factors. And uh, yeah, it can be awesome to use this to help locate services and allocate resources. Uh, but if we consider its epistemology and ontology, uh, we realize that no matter how many different categories you could add, uh, that it isn't quite complete. Uh, so yeah, let's first consider the epistemology. Uh, so like any research, uh, traditional GIS uh, often has a particular way of knowing in the world. Uh, it should be evident that in most cases, uh, GIS as it is usually performed exudes this language and practice of calculation and measurement and modeling uh, that's intended to generate these standardized accounts of people and places. Uh, so it's a way to bring objective scientific reasoning and rational thought to spatial analysis. Um, traditional GIS is usually quantified or categorized in some way. Uh, you can perform the procedures the exact same way each time. Uh, and if the data is the same, you should get the same results regardless of who does them. Um, so yeah, there's obviously great benefits to this. Uh, ontologically speaking, um, this way of doing traditional GIS usually means that it promotes a position that's based on realism. So broadly speaking, uh, this position claims that there's an external reality uh, independent of what people think or believe. So this is uh, definitely not wrong per se, um, but GIS often leaves little room for idealism, uh, which claims that reality can only be understood via the human mind and socially constructed meanings. So if we want to understand emotions in place attachments, uh, we need to be able to include the idealistic perspectives alongside those based on realism. Now, it's definitely not like an either or sort of thing. So yeah, uh, now that we have a little understanding of traditional GIS, uh, let's consider qual GIS. Um, so what is qualitative GIS? Um, at its most basic, it's an array of methodological efforts to incorporate into GIS more qualitative data than has traditionally been included. Uh, so this means like adding things like photos and observations, uh, narratives and voice recordings, videos, drawings, audio, uh, any other media that we can kind of think of. Uh, but it's also more than simply putting qualitative information and data into a GIS. Uh, it's also a response uh, by Marxist, feminist, and post-structural critics to the way that traditional GIS has been practiced. Uh, so they say that 
though there's merits of traditional GIS, that it can also create this false sense of objectivity, um, that it can perpetuate issues of unequal access and expert knowledge, and that it can demonstrate larger problems with its scientific and social conservatism. Uh, the Qual GIS goals are also a little different. Um, in Qual GIS, uh, it strives to be sensitive to and inquire about negotiated meanings in local contexts, uh, situated knowledges, and individual experiences. Uh, yeah, these are quite different than how GIS is normally practiced, which favors a summary and a single clear narrative over the individuality and messiness. Uh, at its heart, Qual GIS nurtures spatial empathy uh, by embracing site-specific values and emotional preferences. Um, yeah, these goals and ways of knowing are different than traditional GIS and thus complement but don't replace the traditional GIS. Uh, as a result of development in mixed methods research, uh, Qual GIS is being applied in more diverse ways. Um, you see Qual GIS research in the social and the health sciences, recreation studies and open space planning, urban studies and planning, and human environment interaction, just to name a couple. Yeah, so let's uh, look at one of these Qual GIS examples because some of them can be really neat. Uh, so I really like this one that was from Taylor et al. Um, and basically what they did uh, was there were one day arts workshops that were led by arts-based facilitators, uh, the authors and local partners to help understand resilience uh, in two places. That'd be in Cape Town, South Africa and Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, they use techniques such as performance and storytelling, uh, role play and multimedia art. And uh, those outputs were recorded through video photography uh, transcripts in these annotated paper maps. And after using these techniques, uh, the authors put them into this GIS that we can see here. Yeah, so for instance, it included like the storytelling portion uh, where this was a participatory mapping project where the locals told stories about previous flooding events, uh, and then were later asked to mark on the map the flood locations, the impacts and the coping strategies. Um, so sometimes these were digitized as links into these things that were called story spheres, um, which are all of these uh, green dots that we can see here. Um, yeah, there's these 360 degree photos with narratives that give a really down to earth uh, street level view of what things might look like. Yeah, so you can see, you can actually get your eyes on the, on the street and see what the locals see there. Um, yeah, there's also a role play section um, where one local asked another for help, but then the other role played various actors, uh, such like a neighbor police officer to explore what the power relations looked like for that. Um, participants also placed people and organizations on a scale of likely or unlikely uh, to help based on different scenarios. Uh, yeah, the project also included digitizing the extents of previous floods as spoken by the community, um, as well as it also included this uh, social network component, which are these lines that we can see. Um, it consisted of plotting the locations of individuals and organizations, and then digitizing the connection between them um, as different line widths to represent the strength of the connections between those actors. Yeah, so the results, uh, we can see that the map is really messy, right? Uh, in that they don't convey one clear message, uh, but instead a multiplicity of views and local experiences. Um, and it really requires exploration to understand. Uh, looking at the flood map itself, uh, they found that you can see flooding that results from things like blocked drainage channels uh, that weren't necessarily included in the traditional consultancy map. Uh, in regards to the social connections, um, yeah, they're able to represent different cartograph cartographic space uh, where the connections and the relations are more important than lo locations and distances. Um, yeah, these maps were also able to show invisible and informal processes uh, within the GIS. Uh, so, for example, uh, the city officials in Nairobi, they rarely visited uh, the informal sediments 
And so there's this disconnect um, between how the locals experience that location and how the planners experience that location. Uh, but the multimedia and the Qual GIS kind of help to fill this gap and give a street level view rather than the God's eye level view. Yeah, and uh, when they shared these maps with the urban planners, they actually stated that adding personal experiences to the map uh, helped them to better absorb and uh, memorize the information. Yeah, so those is a uh, map I think is pretty intriguing to look at. Uh, I think it's important to understand the implications that go beyond the screen. Uh, and so I've kind of put it into four main points here. Uh, the first is that our personal understanding of space is not simply about aerial differences, uh, but about multi-layered and often contradicting ideas of the world around us. Uh, Qual GIS is one of many avenues uh, to further explore these ideas in research. And uh, though messy, these maps can be more representative of the messy realities that we actually face in real life. Uh, number two is that, uh, as we can see, qualitative GIS strives towards documenting the rich contextual detail of a space uh, in a variety of formats. Uh, so these maps take time to interpret, uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, in doing so, it can contribute to the decision-making process um, by adding experiential knowledge and providing immersive map layers uh, that must be discussed uh, rather than giving single objective answers. Uh, so it can act as these conversation openers rather than conversation closers. Um, traditional technocratic GIS, uh, it tends to provide evidence, uh, which is a really good thing and useful in decision making, uh, but sometimes it can shut down conversation rather than open it up. Uh, yeah, number three is that Qual GIS uh, helps GIS to cope with ideas that it's traditionally struggled with. Uh, we're going to focus on emotion, obviously, but um, it can help to cope with things like time and multiple epistemologies and abstract concepts uh, that don't necessarily have fixed geographic locations. Um, you know, for instance, in this map that we saw, uh, they're able to actually plot heaven, for example, which would be very difficult in a traditional GIS. Uh, and lastly, uh, Qual GIS can help geographic education uh, by integrating different notions of space into the classroom. Uh, currently, most geographic ed education emphasizes uh, this top-down assessment of spaces uh, with finite and bounded perspectives of the world. Um, and there's an underrepresentation of marginalized groups in the data collection. Uh, but an article that I really liked uh, by Batista in 2017, it shows us that Qual GIS education can foster different understandings of space uh, and also give students this real world practice in having to weigh public consultation against technocratic analysis. Uh, yeah, so I'll let uh, Ellie kind of dive more into emotional cartography. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, so Andrew just spent some time discussing qualitative GIS, what it is, why it's important, how it can be used. Our paper really focuses on emotional cartography or emotion mapping as a way to practice qualitative GIS, to collect data related to emotion and then incorporate that data into a GIS. So what is emotional cartography? It's a lot like what it sounds like. It is the mapping of emotions or the visualization of the relationship between a person's emotion and a particular geographic location. And before we talk explicitly about emotional cartography, I want to talk a little bit more about emotion and how emotion sort of fits into the field of geography. Um, I think it's really easy and almost natural for us as academics, um, geographers, GIS practitioners to sort of detach emotion from our work. It's our job to view and analyze the world through the objective eyes of a scientist, not to apply a subjective or emotional reason to, reasoning to the data that we're collecting and analyzing. However, our world is undeniably constructed and lived through emotions. And this is particularly true, I think, when we're talking about the world around us, um, the space, the geographic space that we move through day to day. We all have very unique emotional reactions and attachments to the spaces we move through based largely on our experience of, of those spaces and the social interactions that occur within and around those spaces. And I think acknowledging this I'm really paying attention to the emotional side of geography, what we call the felt geographies of place. Um, uh, excuse me, it creates space for multiple realities and ways of knowing the world. 
and encourages us as researchers to be sensitive to those multiple realities. And we do see this acknowledgement of emotion happening in certain places in the field of geography more and more. There's definitely a push to better understand how our subjective experiences and understandings of space influence how we use and value the environments around us. I think this acknowledgement um, of the importance of emotion has not been as fully accepted into modern GIS research and practice. And this idea is really at the root of the research that Andrew, uh, Brian and I underwent. We really hope to convey the idea that if we want to do empathetic, effective, and inclusive geospatial analysis or geographic analysis, it's really integral that we consider emotion, that we consider the qualitative, or even go beyond just considering and begin to consistently and actively incorporate this type of data into our work. Um, of course, we acknowledge kind of the inherent difficulty of bringing something like emotion into GIS work. Um, emotions, as Andrew alluded to um, just a little bit ago, are very messy, right? They're complex, they're enigmatic, they're difficult to define or bound in any clear methodological way. Um, it can be hard to categorize an emotion, even harder still to analyze or visualize emotions stratigraphically. Computer-based systems are just not really set up to analyze or represent the complexity of an emotion or an experience. There's not a lot of room in those kind of binary systems for fuzziness or ambiguity. And this, of course, a pretty significant reason that the world of GIS has been, um, if not resistant, hesitant to regularly incorporate um, this qualitative information like emotion into their regular practice. Um, but I think it's important to consider what we're missing out on when we decline to consider this important aspect of the human environment relationship into our practice. Again, let's look back at the um, status of Denver's children's map. Now, of course, the information contained in this map is incredibly important. Um, and it's definitely a good indicator of where the city should be putting resources. We can correlate this information, maybe conclude that different variables are connected, et cetera, et cetera. But like we discussed earlier, the variables that this map considers are overwhelmingly quantitative, right? We're looking at things like percentage of obese or overweight children, violent crime, unemployment statistics, children in single family households, et cetera. And of course, this information, this kind of data-driven information can be a great indicator of health and well-being. But I challenge us really to think critically about what we mean when we say well-being. What other factors affect our well-being? Where do we feel happy, sad, scared, or safe? Is it possible that there's something else going on in these kind of low-rated census tracts, these census tracts with multiple obstacles to success? Uh, what are children themselves actually experiencing there? And how can we, as kind of grown-ups who think we know what's best, be empathetic to those experiences and give them their due consideration when we're doing spatial analysis and making maps like this one um, that inform planning and policy decisions? Um, for the sake of grounding all of these ideas um, in kind of a practical urban planning example, let's consider vacant lots. Um, vacant lots are often considered by planners and public health officials to be a detriment or a negative feature of a neighborhood. And this can definitely be true to an extent, right? They can be an eyesore. They can potentially be, you know, a place where criminal activity is happening. They can be dangerous. But there's also a number of studies regarding children specifically that have discussed how younger folks use this type of urban open space for free play and socialization, that they value those spaces on an emotional level. But this qualitative data um, is rarely considered in maps like this, maps kind of intended for planning and policy um, creating in an urban space. And by not paying attention to these types of felt geographies, by not considering subjectivity and qualitative data, or how emotions can inform place attachments, again, what do we lose out in the decision making pro process? When we center kind of our own adult ideas and believe that we know what's best because we've done this analysis, we understand this space on a rational and objective level, then we may end up producing spaces that are at best ineffective and at worst alienating for those who the space was originally intended for. Um, we suggest that emotional cartography or emotion mapping can really be a good way to uncover these individual emotional connections that humans have to the world around them. Uh, we'll talk about our own emotion mapping process in a moment, but first I'd like to briefly discuss just a couple of examples of this process, this practice to give you a better idea of what it can look like. So 
And one of my favorite examples is this sort of social and creative experiment by Christian Nold. So the participants um, in this project were hooked up to mobile biometric sensors and GPS units. The biometric sensors measured hand sweat, which is an indicator of emotional intensity. So as these participants were moving through a space, um, this uh, study took place in Greenwich, the Greenwich neighborhood in London. As they were moving through that space, their biometric emotional responses were connected to specific G GPS points. And the end product was a visualization of emotional changes on the wearer's routes, um, which were then constructed into this kind of cartographic visualization with this data that sort of explained why there was a particular emotional response in a particular place. Um, in this next map, he compiles all of this data um, and shows areas of collective high emotional arousal in red and areas of low emotional arousal in blue, creating this sort of emotional topography of the Greenwich neighborhood. This map is annotated with statements from participants um, that kind of explain why a particular emotion was felt in a particular place. So you have things like, you know, stressful pedestrian crossing. One of my favorites is three youths were hanging out right down here at the bottom. And there's also several that talk about social interactions. Saw Gabriel or Swallow lives here. Um, so looking at this map again, let's reflect back onto that um, Denver children's map, which we'll do again periodically throughout this presentation. And I think it'd be really interesting to see how that map might change or shift if an exercise like this one was included, an exercise that allowed children themselves living in these spaces to kind of tell their own stories and tell us about what it feels like to move through the, um, their worlds. Um, and just briefly, this is an example of something that's pretty high tech, right? But this kind of emotional cartography or motion mapping um, can be practiced through something as simple as cognitive mapping, as we see in this example. Um, this is an emotion mapping process that uses, again, simple cognitive mapping to uncover how local residents feel about certain places and environmental or extractive processes. Um, the author uses a sort of narrative cognitive mapping process where participants could express emotions about ecologies and resources from um, largely indigenous and local viewpoints in this area in Russia. Um, using this mapping method, the author is able to gain a lot of insight kind of about how people who live in this area understand and value their homeland. And of course, um, these kind of hand-drawn or cognitive emotion maps can be creatively integrated into a GIS for analysis. Um, this apologies for the low image quality here, but essentially we're just seeing how, you know, on the left, how a hand drawn map can be kind of digitized into a GIS for later analysis. Um, so I think what we can take away from these examples is that there are really a lot of creative ways to do emotional cartography, some high tech, some low tech. Um, and an important takeaway from this section is just how important we feel it is to really consider and create space for this kind of data in any geographic, place-based, or geospatial analysis. Yes, it can definitely add um, some complexity to a project, but it also allows us to keep our work and ultimately ourselves more empathetic and sensitive to the many diverse viewpoints and ways of knowing the world that, that exist out there. Um, so let's move on and talk about the, our own paper that we wrote. Um, in this project, we used emotion maps as a means of empathizing with children rather than generalizing children's experiences. Instead of using our emotion maps to um, study childhood memory and emotion, we use them as a means of demonstrating how we can make emotions visible cartographically. Through these maps, we're able to see and understand how emotions are critical to our being in the world. These emotions are unique, they're diverse, and they're ever-changing. Um, additionally, through these maps, we are able to visualize how places for children contrast to children's places. Oftentimes, the places that we as adults set aside for children are not the one necessarily the ones that children feel a strong emotional attachment to. And these attachments are often the result of human connection and experience rather than other external structural factors. So to accomplish these goals, to empathize with children and to visualize what places for children might look like in the world, we created our own emotion maps of remembered childhood places, um, and as well as brief um, narratives about kind of what these places mean to us. So we created these maps separately using whatever methods made sense or felt right. Felt right. Interestingly, we all use completely different mapping methods to create our maps. I'll kind of move through these slowly and then we'll revisit them a bit. Um, 
Brian, as you can see, just again, this is kind of a cognitive map, right? So he hand drew his map, um, kind of annotated where the space was, you know, what it meant to him, how he felt in these spaces. Um, Andrew used ArcGIS online um, to kind of create his map, his like his route to his place. And again, annotated, color coded his emotional responses in this way. Um, and my map I created in a GIS and then just moved into Adobe to finish the cartography. So again, we have three very different looking maps, right? Um, but still we can find themes and kind of similarities in how we as children use the space around us, how we felt about a particular place and what informed our emotional connection or disconnection from a particular place. Um, so what can these maps tell us about children's places? I think three important themes, um, excuse me, three important themes stand out. So the first theme here is that um, children have unique emotions with diverse attachments to places. And I'll bring up Andrew's map just to kind of um, sh uh, show how this is in these maps. So one thing these maps tell us, tell, show us is that the wide range of emotions that children feel and express about different places. A place can be joyful, it can be scary, it can be calming or generate confidence. Um, these places that we highlight on our maps are unique to our own identity and experiences and really show the problem with generalizing children's experiences because of that di diversity and complexity of emotion. Um, they also highlight the importance of memory, right? Our memories of a place inform how we feel about them and, how, and these memories can be both positive and negative. Second, these maps highlight um, the unique features of children's places as opposed to places for children. As I mentioned earlier, places for children are often imagined and constructed by adults through adult eyes for children. This is as opposed to children's places, which are the places that children themselves um, sort of seek out and place importance on naturally. Each of our maps highlights a children's place that was special to each of us. For Brian, this special place was kind of a simple drainage area near a series of overflow pipe pipes meant for, meant for flood mitigation. For Andrew, this special place was a particular park near his home. My own special place that I, that I have on this map here um, was a near a railroad bridge down an unsanctioned trail in a city park. This was kind of a secret informal place that was invisible to passersby where my friends and I could sort of hide and be ourselves. And I'm sure if my mother knew that I was hanging out next to a railroad bridge where no one could see me with my friends, she would not have been happy, but this is a place that I felt connected to. And I felt just an emotional connection with. All of these places are intensely personal, almost secretive. You know, these are places where we could escape the adult world into our own childlike environments. And many of these places were also informal, right? They're not necessarily spaces designed by adults with the intention of being used by children. They're children's places, again, rather than places for children. Um, third, these maps highlight the importance of human connection, right? Embedded in our memories of these places are other people as well, our friends or our family members. Each of these maps in our narratives emphasizes that we experience these places or associate these places with others. For Andrew, it was his friend group that he was going to the park with. Um, for Brian, it was his brother and grandmother that kind of um, struck emotional connections in these different places. And for myself, it was my best friend Olivia that I was experiencing this space with. I think this highlights the importance of social engagement and human interaction for, ch for children and how these social relationships help to inform our own place attachments and emotional experiences of the world. Great, yeah, so uh, let's finish this section out uh, by looking one last time uh, at that 2019 Status of Denver's children document. Uh, now we can kind of see how emotional cartography could add to a further understanding of gender's children by capturing these alternate spatial and emotional realities. Uh, by ontologically allowing for alternate socially constructed realities within GIS, uh, we can better account for these diverse perspectives. Uh, it's clear that, yeah, if we're able to integrate qual GIS for children, uh, what we see as being quote unquote better for children may not always be the case if we were to expand this de definition of well-being. Uh, yeah, like other works in qual GIS, it's uh, much more about much more than putting uh, narratives on a map. 
Uh, emotional cartography, it allows for the chance to reimagine the purpose of a cartographic document about children in this adult-centric world. Uh, you know, so perhaps the goal should not be only to gather data, uh, but what instead uh, Jones in a 2008 article calls witnessing. Uh, so he says that to witness is to share and deeply empathize with pain and suffering, the negative, uh, although it could also be applied to joy and love, the positive, uh, and otherness without fully knowing it. So rather than always needing explanation regarding children's emotions, uh, we're free to dwell in different emotional spaces and to accept disorder. Uh, so not only does this help to problematize the rigid boundaries within traditional GIS analysis, uh, we also get to honor children's emotions uh, simply because they exist uh, and take one small step to decolonizing children's spaces. Yeah, so like for me personally going forward, I think I'm going to take uh, what I've learned from this paper and start to ask more critical questions in my work. Things like uh, who's doing the mapping, what's being mapped, how is it being mapped? Um, stepping back a little bit further, thinking about if the goal, is it to extract information and generalize, uh, or is it to witness, uh, or is the goal something else? Um, or even like, should I be studying this in the first place? Uh, or does limiting the research, research actually lead to a liberation of sorts? Uh, yeah, so I think Ellie and I, uh, being grad students, we just uh, really want to wrap things up a bit. Um, you know, for both the incoming students and the returning students, I think I saw a couple of them there. Uh, we thought that we'd like to share uh, some of the experience ourselves writing the paper. Um, you know, and I guess the main point that I think we both want to make uh, is that if we can do it, uh, you can do it too. You know, for those students, whatever the it is, uh, maybe it's a paper, maybe it's becoming a TA, maybe it's a project. Um, the resources are here for you to be able to dream it and do it. Um, yeah, so for me, uh, it was really exciting to get to co collaborate with others. Um, it was nice to seek out people with different interests and talents uh, in particular. Um, and by getting to collaborate with Brian and Ellie, uh, it became obvious how important uh, the mentorship is. Uh, so for me, every step of the process was like pretty darn daunting, um, whether it be the writing part or the editing part. Uh, working through the peer review process, uh, but and then Ellie there made all the difference. Um, yeah, another thing I guess uh, thinking about the paper uh, is that it also really helped to be flexible. Um, so what started as helping to add GIS to this children's geography course uh, got to morph into this. And I thought that that's like actually the fun part. Um, you know, there is no one path through grad school. Um, and so I feel lucky getting to benefit from both following my interests uh, and also following the things that I didn't know that I'd be interested in because they became my interest. Um, yes, yeah, so for, for those current and future students, uh, I guess my advice would be to just choose what's right for you and to enjoy the ride. Yeah, and I will 100% echo all of what Andrew just said. I think writing, a publish, writing and publishing a paper was such a cool kind of bucket list experience as a graduate student, and one that I didn't think that it would be possible to do. Um, I think that particularly in a program like this, that's pretty, at least the MA program, that's pretty explicitly about, you know, GIS and geospatial sciences. It's easy to assume that everyone around you is just there to kind of learn those technical skills, right? To just take a program, programming class and get out of there. Um, that's kind of what I thought moved going into the program when I think in reality, as this project shows that there are students and teachers around you who more than likely share whatever your weird nerdy passion is and they'll nurture that in you. And I think finding those people is really important and can open doors for you. And uh, I just think it would be so cool to continue to see projects and papers similar to this one coming out of the program. Projects that kind of combine um, human geography and GIS in new and interesting ways. Where people are coming together from different backgrounds to explore their, how their unique combination of skills and knowledge can unite to create something great. And that's our presentation and we'll take questions if there are any. I'll stop sharing.
Well, I think people are being shy, so I go for it. <laughs> so, uh, okay, great work. Awesome for emphasizing this, uh, this aspect of geoscience and technology, right? Which, which as you guys uh, uh, presented, is not as common as it should be, right? Uh, so quick question. When you collected your, your data um, from the children or citizens or anybody, how do, how do you do it? Do you sh show them paper map and they sketch on it or they were in front of the computer? I I'm thinking like open street map, fill, fill uh, maps in which allow you to print the map and then people can sketch on it, scan it and upload it to open street map. Is there, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, we didn't really, so we, we were thinking about kind of doing something like that, like a data collection process with children, but this was happening kind of in the throes of COVID, so that became kind of not a possibility. So rather than actually collect data from children, we kind of used this project. Um, we essentially collected our own data. We kind of created our own emotion maps of these remembered childhood places, almost as a way to just kind of demonstrate how this process could be done. So in our paper, rather than like collect data and kind of analyze data, it was more of just a discussion of why this kind of thing is important, an example of how it can be done using essentially our own, uh, the data that we had between the three of us, essentially. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes, Peter, I see your, your hand. Oh, <clears throat> thank you. I think that was an incredibly well presented, um, a, a really nicely done presentation. It always sort of impresses me what our graduate students can do. That was definitely on par with anything I, you could present at a, a, an appropriate conference. Uh, my question is, as you investigated this, one of the trends in, in GIS is, as I'm sure you both know well, volunteered geographic information or open open sourced data and i was wondering if you've seen any uh examples of any any kind of crowdsourced um data collection method that kind of speaks to this emotional side or to children in particular i'm maybe you haven't but i was just curious <laughs> I, so most of the studies that we looked at, I think were more like actual studies where people went out and kind of found participants. I think particularly with children, I think doing kind of that kind of that open source or crowdsourcing can be challenging because often it demands that you kind of, you have to teach the child how to use the technology and then they have to kind of actually go do it and they may need, um, you know, guidance, right? Um, so. I don't know about Andrew or Brian, I didn't find any that were specifically crowdsourced. The, the, the one that, the example that I showed, the um, emotional cartography example, wasn't quite crowdsourced, but it was definitely like, we'll give you these things, go out and do it. Um, I don't know if Andrew can speak to any of that either. But. Yeah, I guess that I haven't seen any with children in particular, um, but I forget the exact studies, but uh, people right now are doing things where they get, uh, like geolocated Facebook and Twitter posts and are able to pick out certain words uh, regarding emotions within those um, and get that from obviously almost everybody using those sources and able to make different cartographic outputs with that. Um, I can't think of anything else though. Yeah, there's lots of good um, studies on the Twitter data in particular where they'll sort of um, map terms that come out i've seen examples of where they have mapped anxiety about politics and COVID and things like that it's a really interesting field of study i agree i think um first of all great presentation um ellie and andrew um and i i i think it's a fantastic question from peter because it links back to Raphael's earlier question which is in this particular sort of epistemological and ontological realm, what constitutes data to begin with, right? And I, and I wonder if that question maybe makes this notion of an open source um, platform that much more challenging because data could come in so many different forms and, and ways and shapes and sizes that uh, how, how might one 
organize and, and connect and correlate and collate um, such disparate pieces of data that all each of which is equally valid. And, and I, I, not, I don't have the answer to that, but I think both of you and, and the questions uh, point to some of the really exciting possibilities ahead. And I think often with kind of the big, and I'm not an expert in like the big data, but, um, you know, I think our project is really all about these individual experiences and important qualitative data that's really emotionally informed. And big data has a tendency to kind of generalize, which is the opposite kind of what we thought to do in our paper. Um, while it can be super useful, I think you have to be careful when you're using things like these big crowdsourced data sets because you're getting these kind of big generalization kind of averages, which is almost the opposite of what qualitative GIS seeks to do, because you really are focusing on like these situated knowledge, knowledges um, and individual experiences. So it's, it's a fine line. And, and again, you know, I think there's increasingly creative ways out there that this is being done, um, but you always have to kind of keep that in mind, it's, you know, on your data collection method, what are you missing when you collect data in a certain way and what are you gaining, right? Um, that conversation is important to consider. Can I ask a question? Um, thank you guys both for the great presentation. It's really interesting. And um, I guess I finally got to see what you guys were doing behind those closed doors after all those years of working on this. This is the project. It's awesome to see. Um, and I have, I guess it's more of a comment than a question. Maybe a question will emerge as I move through this comment. Um, but it seems to me like there were two, and I actually, Ellie, your last statement kind of got to this point, two ways in which you were, you're thinking about emotions. One is measuring emotions. So like the Twitter feed and seeing how people are feeling in different places and sort of mapping that out, right? And mapping, measuring emotions um, geographically, spatially. And then also using emotions to measure, right? So like giving a camera to someone and saying, go out there and take pictures, uh, giving them a video and seeing what their particular emotional state reveals about the places that they're in, right? That situated knowledge uh, that you just mentioned. And so I guess I'm, I'm just stating that I noted two ways in which you guys are sort of treating emotions within the research. And um, so maybe the question is, is um, how you um, feel about those two really different ways of treating. One is much more kind of maybe quantitatively inclined, right? And the other is more qualitatively inclined and sort of how you think about the juxtaposition of those two ways of treating emotional data. You don't have to really answer that question because it really is just a comment rephrased as a question. <laughs> but I, I just noted those two really distinct ways. They're really different ways of thinking about and mapping emotions. I guess my, and I, please Andrew and Brian jump in. I think my, my like first thought about that statement is that kind of statement encapsulates like qualitative GIS or like emotional GIS, right? Um, kind of that like quantitative measurements being complemented by that um, qualitative measurement, I guess. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. So I, that's kind of what this seeks to do essentially is do both of those things simultaneously. And Andrew and Brian, feel free. Yeah, I think that's really well put, Gregory. Um, because it, it very depends on the, the actual goal of the end product that you take. Um, yeah, whether it, whether it is to be able to generalize a standardized account or whether it's um, also trying to kind of give power to those that traditionally didn't have power within GIS. Thanks. I guess we can just talk when we're ready. Um, I think Ellie and Andrew both, if I was, if I got it right, they both made the point that spaces that adults think would be good for kids and what kids actually like might be two different, two different things. And I found that kind of interesting. It sort of reminded me of the, the kids at Christmas time who play with the box instead of the gift. 
So, um, you know, maybe we should be listening more to the kids. But uh, great, great job on the presentation and I'm very impressed uh, just with the whole topic and, and what you did. Thank you. Ms. Peter. Yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo that comment. I think a really important point about this and one that um, GISers have discussed for a while and one that I'm always thinking about ways of trying to incorporate more in my own teaching is this idea of empowerment. Uh, and I know you mentioned that in your, your lecture, but I think we can generalize this beyond children. Um, and and basic, the basic idea is um, that, you know, when you kind of put yourself in the confines of this sort of GIS constructed reality, that it, it's difficult for some people uh, to kind of exert their voice or express their power. And I think it goes well beyond children. Children are, I think, an ideal um, area to explore this because they're sort of inherently disempowered in a lot of ways. Uh, but there's a really interesting literature out there on how, you know, indigenous groups or, or disadvantaged urban groups have, have worked on leveraging uh, GIS and, and mapping um, to empower themselves. And so that's not really a question as much as a comment, but I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's got a, a lot of promise still in the field. Tom, Tom, did you have a question? I, I thought I may have seen a hand. Uh, I did. Um, originally, I was, I was just taking it all in. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I can, I, this was an awesome presentation, first of all. I, I very much appreciated it. This really tugs at my own heartstrings. I'm such a reminiscent kind of person, and I kind of hearken back to my own childhood a lot. Um, and I can only imagine what my map would look like, the, all these kind of sketches of the Golden Heights neighborhood, right, adjacent to the Jefferson County Fair, Fairgrounds out in Golden, and um, which is where I grew up, just a few, you know, five, six, seven miles or something like that from campus. And so, um, and I, I'm, I'm curious about a couple of things actually. So one of them, um, and again, these are not necessarily questions to answer. I, maybe one of these is kind of more specific, I suppose. When you were describing this project to people in your own life, right? Um, I'm wondering whether or not that, that uh, was an opportunity for for you to somehow connect about your child about their childhood, some kind of comparative analysis between your own childhood stories, or perhaps it was a sibling or something where they had, or a cousin or something like that, where they had very different kind of like um, impressions of what happened, right? And I wonder whether that that you know we've talked about kind of various scales of this type of information and data everything from the individual, which is what you focused on, all the way to kind of big data, where like you're taking thousands of people in the same neighborhood or something and kind of trying to connect through some kind of Twitter feed or something, right? And I'm wondering whether there's like, I, I mean, there's a gradient in that, in that, in the distinction between those things, right? Where there could be some kind of comparative analysis, for example, between like siblings and how they remember a particular event, if they were to kind of draw that out, or, or perhaps it's, siblings and they're trying to remember kind of like where that particular fort was or where the treehouse was or where the where where that kind of unsanctioned place you know unsanctioned hangout was in the neighborhood or or what have you and so i guess uh, you know that got convoluted there for a second but basically i'm kind of wondering about like your own kind of comparative analysis with the people in your lives as you were describing this project to them Yeah, um, so I, I did my emotion map on a walk to the park and um, I'm really close with my brother uh, who we would walk to the park all the time as well. And uh, it's really interesting sharing the things that I noted on the walk versus the things that he noted on the walk. Um, so like for, for instance, I love this like flowering tree that would um, bloom every time around this year uh, and he could care less. Um, and then, you know, even, even uh, the specific route that we took, um, I would like to go up, up these hills to the park that were not quite as steep. 
Um, whereas he always wanted to take the steepest hill and ride his bike like the fastest down it that he probably could. Um, so it's it really interesting to see just the things that we value differently uh, based on our personalities. Ellie, yeah, go for I, it. I, oh, I'm sorry. I did not speak to the, but the friend that I took, would take my walk with. Um, unfortunately, that would be fun, and I might, and I might do that now. I think that'd be a cool comparison. But I think Andrew's statement speaks to that idea that we talk about in the paper about these diverse emotions, right? How we all experience, we can experience the same place in two different ways. Um, and just how important it is to kind of consider all of that, right? To not generalize and to like create space for all of those ways to experience. And like when we're thinking about the spaces around us to make sure that those spaces kind of provide an opportunity to kind of be there in a different way, right? For a different person. Um, yeah, Ryan, please. Sure. Actually, it's interesting you, you asked a question, Tom, because I have not shared my emotion map with my siblings in part because I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I'm gonna get the remark that says, Brian, you're full of it, right? This, this never happened. <laughs> we never went there. And I feel like a comment like that would detract from my own sort of construction of my childhood memories and, and maybe even delegitimize in some way sort of what I felt was important to me. And so I've, I've, I've held on to that those memories very tightly in, 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 in part because of that. And so it's an interesting way to think about, yeah, what, what these mean. So thanks for asking. I, I didn't even consider that till right now. So yeah. yeah, Peter. So I have to ask one more question. I remember um, as a grad, there was a lot of discussion about whether GIS technology was even really capable of, of this, the kind of qualitative mapping you're talking about. I'm just curious if you think um, is story map a good medium for that? And where are the things you would like to see enabled by the technology to kind of facilitate this, this type of mapping? I mean, I think story mapping is a great way to do it. I think that the example that Andrew showed us with kind of the multimedia um, is really great, right? Because it's this creative way to show like the messiness that we've been talking about. There's like all these different types of media and all these different kind of like places you can go and it kind of shows the connections. Uh, and so as, as I was talking uh, with him over the phone, he, um, I expressed to him how as a complete sort of novice in GIS, I think it was this particular project and, and working with Ellie and Andrew that um, gave me the courage really to, to step into an area that I had absolutely no, no training in, uh, no prior sort of experience with, but it's, I think, allowed me to, in this process, I really appreciate what GIS is and what it can do. Um, and I think sometimes what I've come to appreciate is that we can come into these fields and these areas without necessarily following the traditional path. Um, I, I think of a much deeper, <laughs> at least I think that's what Andrew and Ellie tell me, that I've developed a particular language now around GIS that I never thought I would be comfortable using um, years ago. So I think it's, it's not just in the workplace, Raphael, but I think even for ourselves, how do we reach into these spaces that we are unfamiliar with? Um, and how do we gain a deeper familiarity with it, perhaps in, in very novel ways? So I, I, I'm definitely appreciative of, of this opportunity. Um, yeah. you, you are in control, Brian, so it's... Oh, right. <laughs> I didn't Sorry. want to interfere with your thing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I was wondering, did, did, did anybody else have other comments or questions, um, things they want? This is our final, not final, but sort of um, goodbye in a sense to, to Andrew and Ellie. Um, and we're excited for what they're going to be doing. Um, and um, 
I think as, as Alicia brought up, I think there's a lot of potential uh, for this area of study moving ahead. And I personally am, am excited to see where uh, both of you, um, Andrew and Ellie, take this as you move into your respective um, careers. Uh, Peter. I hope maybe one of you will consider um, talking to my intro to mapping class. I think this would be great for, I, you know, I've, I've been really thinking about how to incorporate more on power and these qualitative forms of mapping. And I thought that was an excellent survey that would be pitched really nicely for that group. So you can assign them, you can assign them our paper to read. <laughs> Oh, of course, yes, that goes without saying, so. Speaking, speaking of courses, actually, Peter, I was gonna ask, um, as, you, as you look from your position sort of as, as chair, what, what are the possibilities down the road that we might have a course, perhaps, on this topic, on qualitative GIS within the um, curriculum here? Well, I mean, um, in a lot of GIS programs, I don't know what yours was like, Alicia, Mine had sort of started doing, uh, putting courses out like that. Um, I mean, we've got a lot of things we're trying to add to the program. That's something we could, I mean, part of it's just finding somebody who is engaged with that research enough to teach it. Um, but I mean, definitely that's something we can put on our radar. I'll volunteer to be part of that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's really important that we make an effort and i realize you know there's only so much we can do but i fully support it um and alicia that's awesome you can help <laughs> you know all that we can get yeah call me in as well i mean i think like i said i think we've got themes that like on qualitative gis as well as a really important strain of work on on power and applying gis to kind of social theoretical perspectives both of which might fit in a in, in a class like that. Or even the critical GIS class or something. Critical. Yeah, exactly. That's that, that's the, the phrase. <laughs>